This video is part of the series in a first course in modelling analysis and control and here we're going to look at an introduction to time series models. So it's often convenient to consider values at distinct points in time rather than as continuous signals and you can see that with these two graphs here. Now rainfall charts for example might be weekly, monthly or yearly. Car sales are usually by month or year and Often measurements are done regularly rather than continuously. So as engineers, we need a mathematical framework to handle this discrete or sampled data. So now we're going to introduce the concept of a time series model. Where there is an analytic relationship between values at different sampling instants, we want some standard way of capturing this. We're going to use some examples to demonstrate that you probably already know a lot of these models, even if you haven't realised it. Bank savings then. George deposits a certain amount here, a thousand pounds, into a savings account, which pays a very generous rate of 10% a year. What's the savings model? Well, you would very confidently write that after one year, he's going to have one plus P times S zero, where P is the interest rate. After the second year, he's going to have 1 plus p times what he had after the first year. Then after the third year, 1 plus p times what he had after the second year. And you can put these together and you can see after the third year, he's got 1 plus p cubed times what he put in. Now, I can draw a graph of this and show how his savings grows with year. And in general terms, I can write a model of the form Sn, so the amount after n years, is 1 plus p times the amount after n minus 1 years. What if then there were some annual charges, which there often are for um, accounts which give better interest rates, and here the annual charge is going to be £30 a year. Now all we do therefore is modify the model like this. What we've got at the end of year 1 is 1 plus p times what we had at the beginning of the year minus the charge. You'll see that obviously with charges, your amount of savings is not going to grow as quickly. And if you want a generic model, I've put it down here. What about radioactive decay? Now radiation from naturally occurring elements is known to have a half-life. This is a term which you will probably come across. Half-life is the time over which the radioactivity has dropped by 50%. So you're talking about a model of this form. Radioactivity D is not or d at time n is 0.5 what it was at time n minus 1, where the difference between those two times is the half-life. Now half-life may have some rather clumsy sampling periods. So for uranium-234, you can see the half-life here. I'm not being precise, but it's about 248,000 years. So it might be easier to replace this model with a simpler time scale, such as years, decades or centuries. How are we going to do that? Then? So let's assume as a model exists of this form, an update model, which is a model where we're updating every t years rather than along the half-life. And now let's see what happens after k times that, so kt yearly. So if I update that k times, I'm going to end up with this model here, sn plus k equals a to the k times sn. Now what I'm going to assume is that kt is the half-life. And therefore, I know that if I use the half-life model, dr plus 1 equals 0.5 dr, then a to the k has got to be equal to 0.5. So this is what we've got here. You can see that for uranium-234, adopting a time scale of 100 years is going to be 1 over 2480 the half-life. And therefore, you can end up with a formula that a to the 2480 equals 0.5. So I can find a value for A where the update period is now 100 years rather than 248,000 years. Now if we solve that, you can find a corresponding value of A and now you can see we can update things more easily using centuries rather than using the half-life which was a very awkward number. Obviously for this particular um, element, it takes a long, long time for any decay, and you only see the exponential shape. You can see I've gone here to 8,000, 10,000 centuries, so it's a very long, long time. 
finding time series models. While the model for savings is self-evident, and to some extent for radioactivity, this is less so for many engineering and natural systems. So we've got to ask, how might we determine a suitable time series model to represent an engineering system? Now there are some tailored solutions for first order ODs, which I'll give first, and then we'll look at a slightly more generic model. Here's a first order model then, the one that we've already dealt with that work for savings and work for radioactivity. So SN plus 1 equals ASN. And you can see I've done the graph here showing you how that evolves. In this particular case, A is less than 1. Now, if I take logarithms of both sides of that equation, I end up with this expression here. And the key thing you notice is that log A is a constant. So what you've got is a straight line graph, here it is, with slope log A. So the samples is this value n. So you've got a straight line graph if you take logs of both sides. And that means you can work out what A is. So in other words, what we're telling you is if you are to calculate the values log Sn and calculate n log, sorry, sorry, just, um, if you just calculate log Sn and plot it against n, you will get this straight line and you can work out A. What happens though in practice is you tend to have noisy data. You can see here that although a true curve would follow the green dotted line, you can see the actual measurements are up and down. They don't follow the true curve. So there's the true curve. That's what the system should be doing. But in practice, your actual measurements, Sn, are disturbed by some noise. So what you measure is slightly away from the true curve. However, still, if you take logs of both sides, so now I'm still going to take the log of Sn, and you'll notice the difference is I've put an approximately equal to n log a plus log S0. So if I do the same plot as before, what you find is yes, the values are no longer exactly on a straight line, but they're approximately on a straight line. So it's really relatively straightforward to do a best straight line fit and still work out the underlying value of A to reasonable accuracy. What then if you have higher order time series models? So in general, your time series model will have lots of coefficients. You can see here I've got A1, A2, B1, B2, and you'll see the dependence links to a lot more variables. So the current value of X depends on the previous value, the value two samples ago, the value three samples ago, and also on the inputs, one sample ago, two sample ago, and so on. Now, it might be possible to derive the coefficients from first principles modelling, but in practice, people usually get these from measured data. So what we do is we focus on this E term. So the error between this bit and this bit. So what we're saying is if we can choose the coefficients such that that error is small, then the likelihood is those coefficients represent our system. So what are we going to do then? How are we going to minimize this error? Well, what people normally do is they say the best coefficients are the ones that minimize a term a bit like this. So this is least squares. So we basically add up all the errors over a large number of samples, here m samples, square them, and we say the coefficient choices which minimize that term are the ones which best represent my system. So what I can do, if I assume some form of model here, so I've assumed here a simple first order model, so I've got a coefficient a1 and a coefficient b1, then that optimization, I'm doing this quickly because you can look at it elsewhere, reduces to that, and I can solve for the coefficients a and the coefficients b. Now, because there's noise in this system, because the data is not pure, you can see the values that I've identified for my optimization are not exactly the same as the true values. But you're never going to get the true values when you've got noisy data. Now, if you're interested in how you might go about doing such optimizations, what people normally do is they stack all the errors in a vector and then use matrix vector notation to capture the dependency between measured values, x and u, and your parameters, a and b. 
And then what you do is you substitute those into your performance index J, and you end up with a nice form a bit like this. And once you've done that, you can take the grad, set it to zero, and you find you get a nice, neat expression for the parameters A and B. Some conclusions then. This video has given a brief introduction to time series models for representing systems where measurements and inputs are taken only at specified regular time instants. Having such models allows us to analyse and understand how those systems behave. What we're going to do next is expand these models to Z transforms, which more formally consider the interaction between continuous systems and the sampling measurement process, and thus will provide a systematic mechanism for control.